Dan, one of the key uh, and defining characteristics of this energy transition is that it was begun, policy was a driver early on in the 80s and 90s, places like Germany had feed-in tariffs for, for wind, that sort of thing. But the uh, tech, the basic electro technologies, and we're talking uh, solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, electric vehicles, and heat pumps, all of those were proceeding along the bottom of the S-curve, the adoption S-curve, but they hit their inflection point around 2020. And different, you know, maybe 2021 in this one, 2019 in that country, whatever. But this is fairly recent. And it, it, it shapes the way we think about the energy transition, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of remarkable if you think about these uh, pieces of electrotech. They're, they all have a long, long history. So uh, the solar panel, of course, decades and decades old. Uh, batteries, uh, I mean, going back, of course, all, to, all the way to 1850, but the modern battery uh, way back to 1990. These are technologies that we've been working on for decades, if not more than a century in some cases. So these are the technologies that not just us, but our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents worked and innovated on to make better and cheaper. And so you see very steadily, you know, following Wright's law of, uh, of cost decline, kind of very predictably one decade after the next costs falling and quality improving. What is so remarkable at the moment that we're living in today is that just over the past five years, these technologies are suddenly almost by magic becoming all cost competitive at the same time after this very predictable trends for decades and decades, somehow they seem to kind of converge in this decade. If you think about levelized cost of electricity basis, uh, solar and wind cost becoming competitive with fossil fuels happened over the past five years. Batteries becoming cost competitive and able to compete with peaker gas plants getting competitive just over the last couple of years. Uh, ICE cars losing against EV cars, first on total cost of ownership and now increasingly on sticker price, hap is happening kind of right now. And over the past like two years, we've seen that wave starting. Uh, heat pumps actually being able to cool like in cold climates. The cold climate heat pump challenge that, that, that was here in the US one, two, three years ago, also very recent. So we live in this remarkable moment where all of these technologies we've been working on for so long, suddenly over the past five years, hit this tipping point, not just in terms of uptake, but in terms of its economics and its potential. Uh, and that's, I think, why, why we should be very excited about the moment that we live in right now. We have this century of evolution on these technologies that suddenly now are coming together in this sort of, you know, this decade of revolution. Uh, and, and that's why we're seeing also the ODS curve shoot up across the world. Here's an interesting point. Um, I mentioned earlier that it's not policy anymore that is driving the energy transition. It's technology adoption, these better technologies at, at lower prices. But that seems to be uh, a common view outside of North America, partly in Europe, but even, uh, you know, only partly. But here in Canada, we're having this very interesting uh, discussion right now uh, because we've had 10 decades or sorry, 10 years of fairly stringent climate policy under the Justin Trudeau liberals. Now, he's not prime minister anymore. We've got Mark Carney in. Uh, and what that does is when you are locked into a fossil fuel economy as Canada is, and you think only in terms of climate policy, it dominates your narrative. It's how you think, and you think only cha change will only happen if you have stringent enough policy. If you can, it's moral suasion to persuade people to do things different. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this is this this is technology getting cheaper. It's markets changing. It's it's structural change in the energy system, and that hasn't filtered through to North America yet. I agree, and I, I, to be honest, I would put a lot of Europe in that camp as well, right? It 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 goes into I think the the the. the uh, a poor framing of the energy transition in the West, seeing it as a purely moral obligation focused sort of very technocratically on carbon energy sector as a problem to be solved in the race against solving for, for climate change, which, you know, is, is a very valiant race that we should focus on. But there's so much more to this, uh, especially when technologies hit these cost tipping points and can, can go by themselves. All of a sudden, it doesn't become a question of, you know, um, 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 
how to make this happen. It's more a question of how can we make money while this is happening? How can we make sure that we, we enrich ourselves as a nation of this inevitable new technology wave that's coming? Because I do think this is really an inevitable wave that's coming. Um, and oftentimes when I say that, then people immediately start talking about, yeah, but at what pace then, et cetera. That's not the point. Like we know that in a hundred years, this will be, the electrotech revolution will have completed. It is now just a question of which countries came there first, which countries reached that first and got those first and second and third movers advantages over the rest of the world. And this is, I think, the, the changing mindset that we need in, in, well, I think it's Canada, US and also Europe. So I would just say the West is that we need to get rid of this framing that uh, these new energy technologies are coming in because we will them into the system. By now, there are much more fundamental drivers that are putting them into the system, right? These drivers of physics, economics, and geopolitics. And now it just becomes much more a question of how can we benefit more than just the carbon benefit? How can we benefit from these technologies? How can we actually get rich of them? Uh, and pl plenty of ways to do that. We have plenty of opportunities to do that in the West. We just need to be clever enough to grasp that. And part of that is, I fully agree, let go of this overly policy focus on mandates and focus on, you know, industrial policy and how to make a buck of all of this. There, there's a reason why the policy first narrative is so embedded in, in policy in government circles and industry circles. And so um, what we what you see, if you go into OPEC, for example, and you look at the assumptions behind their modeling, what it, they state very clearly is that electrotech is going to remain too expensive versus you know oil and gas uh, technologies and the demand for electrotech will rise or fall they think fall based on policy they think that government uh, support for climate policy is going to wane over time too expensive too much trouble you know and and so as policy recedes then we'll see the uptake of electrotech begin to uh, slow and maybe even uh, plateau. And I know this in Canada because I have asked the minister, federal minister of energy department, which modeling scenarios inform your minister's public comments. And they came back and said, and they gave me a list and it's all the conservative policy first kind of scenarios, the IEA steps, OPEC, uh, Exxon Mobil, BP, and Shell, the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Now, you you recognize all of those names, and you you know where they stand from. But for those uh, viewers who don't, those are all the the modelers, the who are you know, forecasting, and they think it's going to be slow. They think that fossil fuels will dominate because policy is not going to be able to speed it up. And I would argue, Dan. The modelers, those modelers that influence policymakers and you know politicians, have got it wrong. It's um, it's an issue that I see, to be honest, Mark, I'm on both sides of the spectrum. Because let's think about the IPCC scenarios or the IEA net zero scenarios, or or even how IEA frames their their non like the scenarios that we find much more sensible, which is like the steps and the right, the, the announced policies and uh, and and current policy scenario, this kind of stuff. It's all framed around policy. And what's so interesting is that on both sides of this debate, we see that there's almost like a tacit agreement between the net zero community and the, and the OPEC community that it's all about carbon and it's all about policy. And so all their scenarios are framed around how much carbon and what kind of policy. And then it just becomes a debate between OPEC believes that government is not very, cannot be very successful and small government will win over big government. And so you get slow change. And then on the other side, you believe that on the net zero side, there's a belief that big government and big action will actually win out and actually will, will, will I mean, either win out or has to win out. Uh, there's a lot of should in there, I suppose. Um, and th then th those are just two conceptions and two debates on how effective we think policymaking can be. And then what we like to do with our electrotech views, we like to stay, step back from that and say, like, Listen, if you look at uh, the US over the past like 15, 20 years and you look at the rise of new energy technologies, it's kind of administration agnostic. You had very bad policy, you had very good policies, but the S-curve remains unperturbed in its, uh, in its trend upwards. I mean, you put it just now quite well um, um, uh, in an earlier conversation that we had on the rise of uh, uh, the ICE vehicle uh, during World War I and World War II. We have two world wars, but the S-curve looks perfectly smooth upwards. 
right? That's an indication that maybe we do overemphasize the role of policy. Not to say that policy is not important in any of this. It's a key enabler, obviously, to get things off the ground. But there are deeper forces at play or deeper market forces that actually help new technologies go up the S-curve. And so this is what we try to do to get out of this polarized debate between sort of, you know, stylized of OPEC and IPCC uh, and say, actually, let's reject the tacit agreement that it's all about carbon and policy. And let's look at this through a market first lens. Um, because when we look at previous energy uh, transition history, this has also been very much a market and uh, 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 economics led uh, uh, kind of transitions rather than a, you know, forceful government mandate type of transition. Uh, I want to end the, our, our interview, Dan, by telling you a little story, because uh, last August of 2024, uh, I uh, reviewed an, an online energy transition course offered by the University of Alberta, which is notoriously uh, tied to the oil, Alberta oil and gas industry. And that particular training course only posited only two worldviews, the, the two that you, we call them the uh, uh, oil and gas forever view and the, the world is burning climate change view. And they said, this one is kind of, you know, it's kind of idealistic and, and not very practical, but this oil and gas forever view, that's, you know, that, and that was what the course was about. And my criticism at the time was that you've, they've completely missed the worldview that you're talk, you and I are talking about, which is electrotech and and renewables and electricity and the electrification of economies, and that's a separate worldview with separate analytical uh, models and 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 so on. And I think is, is far and away the more superior argument. And they completely missed it. And I and I I will admit, Dan, I said that I made my argument in no uncertain terms. And ruffled feathers like you would not believe. We had a, I mean, I was a, you know, nasty things were said about me because uh, I wrote this. But the fact remains, it's, I was right. Th this is exactly how things are rolling out. And my point here is how deeply embedded the two dominant narratives are and how much pushback there is in fossil fuel exporting uh, countries against the third narrative that you and I kind of favor. Yes, because it's a paradigm shift, right? Because at its core, um, well, as I said, those two, those first two camps kind of agree that it's all about carbon and policy. And so this is a paradigm shift where you say, no, it's not. It's actually about uh, just basic economics and a technology revolution. Every sector thinks they're immune to disruption until they're disrupted. And I, I can't help but shake this feeling that, you know, these kind of conversations, uh, as you describe here in, in, in Canada, in your case, to what extent they don't just mimic what the boardrooms of Kodak and Blockbusters just before they, uh, they, they went on the decline. How it's like, well, you know, we're, we're kind of straw man the other side. We say those are just net zero Puritans. We are the fossil, uh, was it fossils forever, oil and gas forever camp. Uh, it's simple to see that we have a more reasonable argument. That's it. And this is, I think, where there's such a reticence to accepting this electrotech uh, uh, argument on the on the fossil side, because it's actually the more compelling, I think, paradigm shifting one. Um, and, and that's, I think, why we need to keep pushing this message, because this is actually an exciting message. By the way, also exciting for oil and gas majors. This should be exciting for everyone, because everyone can play a role in this new uh, uh, energy system. Uh, one more point, because this is really important, and I get the pushback from this all the time out of Alberta. Uh, you know, it's just kind of Canada's Texas is the oil and gas epicenter of the oil and gas industry in, in this country. And they and they people say, are you telling me that the big oil companies don't understand what's going on, that they have all those smart people in their company and they and they don't recognize these kinds of trends? And you brought up Blockbuster. And one of the things we know about Blockbuster is in 2004, Netflix came to Blockbuster and said, we want to sell our company to you for $50 million. And so Blockbuster management did their due diligence. They tore that business model apart and then they concluded that it would never be viable. There would never be the kind of infrastructure that would be necessary that every household could stream video. And so they passed on Netflix and four years later, Blockbuster was, was uh, bankrupt. And the, here's the point. And Clay Christensen from Harvard Business Review makes this. 
they made a mistake. They miscalculated. They missed the disruption. They didn't understand it when they were looking it right in the face. And the oil and gas companies are making exactly the same mistake the blockbuster management made. They can't see that they've been disrupted. They don't know where it's coming from. And of course, it's coming from electric vehicles because that's 75% of the demand, global demand for oil. What, uh, yeah. there's, my, there's my argument, uh, if you okay. want to respond to it. No, I think this is, I think this is right. And, and one of my fears, Markham, more and more, is I think it's becoming so obvious that this is now a disruptive technology revolution. And, and what I fear is the fact that the conversation in the West is not moving on right now, but sticking with this old framing makes me fear a little bit that this is an innovator's dilemma, um, a Christensen's uh, framing, an innovator's dilemma at a geopolitical scale, that our political debates are actually mimicking the boardroom debates at Kodak, right? Is that we're, as, as, as a country or as, as a community in the West, are stuck in an old mindset and we can't really get past that. And I think this is the part that's much more scary because if you start applying Christensen's innovator's dilemma of incumbents failing to whole countries, then it gets very scary. And this is why we need to really work hard on the narrative right now in the West to unchain our way of looking at energy just through the lens of the old energy system and, and open ourselves up. And, and, and we think we have a compelling narrative with the Electrotech revolution. I'm sure there are others with other compelling narratives. We need to break open this conversation and start chatting about different views of the future. Because if we chain ourselves you know, physically, but also mentally to the old systems, then we will go down with it as well. And I think this is a real and serious risk right now for the West. Uh, and we need, to, we, need to, we need to get on with it and actually move our thinking uh, to, to a better match what we see happening in the world right now. Because whenever whoever looks at the data closely enough sees just rapid transition going much faster than any of the experts predict. Uh, and we should do something with that. It's new data. I'm a physicist by heart, right? That's my origin. I was a physicist before doing all this. If you get new data, you need to change your theories, no matter how nice they are. Um, and that's what we need to do in energy as well. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm the embodiment, embodiment of the idea that you change as, as the data changes. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Margaret.